Jesus Without Denominations Have you ever wondered why there are so many diverse types of church denominations? Most of these Christian institutions claim they alone represent the one and only true church, inaugurated by Jesus Christ, and the Apostles. It could be Roman Catholic, Episcopalian, Baptist, Pentecostal, or Jehovah's Witnesses. Any number of distinct types or shades of Christianity that one can imagine. The question then begs to be asked, among the 36,000 various Christian groups, how can anyone know exactly who is right or wrong? If you get right down to it, it is nearly impossible to figure out which church is the genuine article. However, to be honest, it simply does not matter. Allow me to elaborate with the following example. Have you ever worked on a project such as a birdhouse, painting furniture, term paper or any other endeavor that took your mind and hands to accomplish? Like so many, very few of us are born experts. Trial and error seem to be the lot for most people. The majority of us at one time or another, after working long and hard on our pet project, have arrived at the sad conclusion, no amount of correction is going to fix our mistakes. The only sensible solution afforded us is to trash the whole work and start over. And that is the exact spot Christianity is currently standing, a hollowed out shell of what it once was. Just exactly how she arrived at this modern fragmented state, one must consider the following negative factors, such as political influences, traditions of man, false teachers, evil cult leaders, governments, cultures, and dark spiritual forces. All having their part in diluting, misrepresenting, or substituting the Bible. To date every one of these factors very nearly destroyed the Bride of Christ and her rebirth identity. Somewhere in all of this chaos, the church and the world has lost their way. So where does that leave us? How about we go back to the beginning, and simply retrace our steps back towards the North Star of Jesus Christ, and the Twelve Apostles. Then taking on the task of personally discovering the only approved church, validated by God Himself. If one is willing to set aside all preconceived notions, traditions, and personal feelings. Afterwards, with an honest heart examine God's pioneering church blueprint. Only then will the answers become surprisingly crystal clear. One would be totally astonished comparing the differences between modern-day Christianity and the original Christian Church of the Bible. When Jesus Christ walked on the earth, He never once went outside of scriptures to make a point. Rather, He upheld and fulfilled all scriptures, confirming them as the ultimate answer regarding heaven and salvation for mankind's soul, and the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. Jesus Christ was literally the Bible manifested in divine human form. Why would anyone professing to be Christian, look outside of scriptures attempting to find better answers than what God spoke. Have no doubt, Jesus Christ gave very explicit commandments how to establish his churches. After all he paid the highest price, so, the Creator should have the final word. Take heed therefore unto yourselves, and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Acts chapter 20 verse 28. God's blood purchased his church and our salvation. Indeed, heaven is not cheap, and God paid the highest price. The Blueprint of Truth The Blueprint of Truth, speaking of the New Testament, is divided into three very distinct sections. As such, all three divisions of God's church blueprint have their very own and incredibly individual ordained purposes. God's triad of truth are as follows. The Gospels, the Acts of the Apostles and the Epistles. Note, the Book of Revelations is being excluded, for it is prophetic writings of future events are not centrist to the salvation message. Besides the aforementioned harmful influences, modern Christianity became fragmented into 10,000 pieces, largely because of unintentional ignorance surrounding these three components within the New Testament. Be cautious, for it is vastly more important what is not found, if not more, than what is revealed within the New Testament salvation plan. Let us investigate the first of the three divisions, which being the books of Matthew, Mark Luke and John. Or what is commonly known as the Four Gospels, here we learn about the birth and life of Jesus, His ministry, the calling of the disciples and His miracles. His death, burial, and resurrection. To better understand the Bible, God had allocated the entire world of humanity into two basic groups, that of Jew and Gentile. The Jewish nation was founded with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the Old Testament along with the written covenants or scripture of God's chosen Jewish nation. Whereas, the term Gentile, simply means non-Jew or all other nations. 
It is vastly important to recognize how both groups of Jew and Gentile were dealt with by God within the New Testament, in order to fully understand Christianity, and salvation accordingly. It is surprisingly noteworthy, not one single Gentile church ever being established in the Gospels, not one single solitary Gentile church. Furthermore, the Jews alone were baptized in water by John the Baptist unto repentance. Gentiles, or non-Jew were excluded from water baptism in these four books. New Testament salvation for the Gentiles was not possible until Jesus was crucified, afterwards ascending to heaven. Luke chapter 22 verse 32 confirms this. Jesus also explicitly states, deliverance for the Gentiles would not be accomplished within the four Gospels, redemption simply must come to the Jews first. Matthew chapter 10 verses 5 through 6 and Matthew chapter 15 verse 24. The Apostle Paul scolded the Jews with the following. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, since you repudiated and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. Acts chapter 13 verse 46. Lastly, Jesus pours out his saving Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, not the four Gospels. So, it makes no scriptural sense, for any Gentile church seeking salvation inside of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It simply was not offered to the Gentile nations at this time, and it cannot be offered now. Wait just one minute. Nearly all churches teach, all that is needed for a soul to be saved is to believe and repent to the Lord. The sinner's prayer comes to mind, just like the thief on the cross. Did not Jesus state, today you will be with me in paradise after the thief repented? Consider this, both thieves on the cross, including Jesus Christ were Jewish and not Gentile. Remember our two groups? One must keep Jew and Gentile separated at this point. During the trial of Christ, Pontius Pilate the Roman governor handed over Barabbas the Jewish murderer to his own people, placing the Lord in his stead. Barabbas was an Israeli insurrectionist whom Pontius Pilate freed. Ironically, his full Jewish name was Yeshua bar Abba, Jesus, the son of the Father. Barabbas had been charged with the crime of treason against Rome, the same crime for which Jesus was falsely convicted. Accordingly, for there was absolutely no love between Rome and Israel, Roman law during this time period, would never ever, ever permit one of their citizens to be crucified by Jewish hands. Certainly, by no means on this particular Jewish high holiday of Passover, for this action would run counter to Roman governmental political sensibilities, as well as their pagan religious worship. The moment the Jewish thief cried out for mercy, asking Jesus to save him, he was repenting to his Lord. Jesus and the thief were both observant Jews. The thief being a Jew understood all that was needed at that point, according to Old Testament or Mosaic law, while he remains alive, was to be a repentant Jew. All examples of saving repentance, within the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John were always Jewish male and female participants only. Zacchaeus the tax collector, Mary Magdalene and the lame man lowered through the roof of the Apostle Peter's house, are just a few examples of salvation given to Israelis in the Gospels. It cannot be overstated the importance of recognizing that not one Gentile or non-Jew received New Testament salvation in the four Gospels. So, if you hear of a modern church promoting individual salvation from the first four books of the New Testament, they are grossly misguided and their salvation is sadly, incomplete. To be noted, Jesus did physically heal a few Gentiles in the four Gospels. However, deliverance could not be offered to them until the book of Acts of the Apostles. It is here within the second division of the New Testament, we discover how the very first church was founded, establishing thereafter the exacting blueprint used to build all other houses of worship that followed. Full New Testament salvation was first experienced on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2 verses 36 through 41. Here we see exactly how a person must be born again. This church period fulfilled the charter of John chapter 3 in verse 5. Every single example of a Gentile or Jew being saved, followed the proven pattern written within this book called Acts of the Apostles. The book of Acts discloses the story of the Apostles Peter and Paul. How they established, educated and built churches properly throughout the Jewish and Gentile nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Jesus said that he would give the keys of heaven to Peter, confirming him the head of the church world. A covenant is an unbreakable contract given by God to humanity, regardless of man's action or inactions. God chose three extremely specific elements to form his abiding promised church, offered to save lost humanity. 
The first element, Acts chapter 20 verse 28 The Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. God shed his own blood on the cross, by doing so, he purchased back humanity from the enslaving power of death and hell. The second covenant element is water. God himself stated, Truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Also, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. God's side was pierced by a Roman spear on the cross, out gushed blood and water from his side. Think of this for a moment, God's blood and water is within the earth's ecosystem of rainwater. Water baptism applies the atoning blood and water, washing away the repentant filth of our sins. Thereby, answering a clear conscience towards God. We are buried with Him in water baptism, and the grave marker name is Jesus Christ. The last element to this unbreakable contract between God and humanity is fire. The Spirit of God has always been a consuming holy and purifying spiritual fire. After the first two elements of blood, repentance and water, baptism, have been applied correctly. God then promises to fill our soul with His Holy Spirit. Every instance in the book of Acts all converts repented and were baptized in Jesus' name or the name of the Lord, then received our Lord's Spirit with the initial evidence of speaking in tongues. Every single example of salvation followed as such. So it was, with the very first Gentile ever saved, ironically, was a Roman soldier like the ones that crucified Christ. Here the Apostle Peter administers God's salvation plan. Acts chapter 10 verses 44 through 48 While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision, Jews, which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water, that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Again, Look carefully at the pattern. Repentance. Turning from your sins or crucifying your old life, water baptism in the Lord's name. Buried with Him in His name, and God filling your soul with His Holy Spirit. The pattern is rigidly fixed throughout the entire book of the Acts of the Apostles. Blood, water and fire. The following is a reminder God was extremely particular on how He ordained His salvation formula. So much so, it was absolutely imperative the Jewish followers of John the Baptist needed rebaptized into a new salvation era, away from Mosaic law to Jesus Christ's saving grace. John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Acts chapter 19 verses 1 through 7 Not one person in the entire Bible was found baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. This needs to be repeated. Not one person, within the entire Bible, was ever baptized by the classifications of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. If one were baptized in these titles, for they are not names, they got a bootleg baptism. Matthew chapter 28 verse 19, bears this out, Proving the titles of Father, Son and Holy Ghost are simply three descriptive classifications of God, and were never meant to replace His ultimate chosen name, that of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, all three titles have one name. The Lord said, I come in my Father's name and you receive me not. Naturally, the Son of God is named Jesus Christ. Lastly, Jesus told His followers He would send the Spirit or the Holy Ghost in His name. It is an obvious distinction, the titles, or classifications of God, all have the same and only name, which being Jesus Christ. If you are a repentant Christian please get rebaptized in Jesus' name, after all why would you not? Don't you do everything else in His name? Truly, there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. The original church and every church established thereafter within the Acts of the Apostles repented, full water baptismal by submersion in Jesus' name, and received the Holy Ghost. After all, this is God's universe and created human souls. If and when we can create our own universe and living beings, then we can decide how we run things. Lastly, the third and last New Testament division, the books of the epistles. 
These written letters were given as directives to believers already saved by the Book of Acts salvation method. Instructing believers how to live, worship and church discipleship. Warning. We do not find one person receiving water baptism and or receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit in all the epistles. The reason? They already repented, were baptized in Jesus' name, and received God's Spirit previously. One can never use the epistles to develop a redemption plan. Therefore, it is absolutely impossible for any church whatsoever to attempt to save any member or new believer, in the first four New Testament books, commonly known as the Gospels. Nor can salvation be found inside the books of the epistle or church letters. One must come in at the only door of Jesus Christ's church, the book of Acts. Finally, the entire Bible with the exception of the book of Luke, was written by the Jews as God directed. Jews from their birth were taught daily, this cherished cornerstone of eternal life, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Jesus is literally the one and only God manifested in the flesh, making himself a sacrifice for our eternal souls by shedding his blood. Thomas one of Jesus' disciples proclaimed to him, My Lord and my God. John chapter 20 verse 28. Stop right here for a moment. Think about this. An Orthodox Jew worshipping another Jewish man, never. Thomas recognized the one and only true God, Jesus Christ. The only infallible and completely trusted standard for our hope is God's spoken word. God himself validates the following about his own scriptures. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 8. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I will say it again, it does not matter what the church is named as long as it embraces the original mandate founded by the Lord. Those church members and the ministry will always seek, learn, and follow Christ's word. If, however, the word is cast off, changed, ignored, or altered in the slightest, by following philosophies of men, historical tradition, false teachers, or bogus prophets not lining up with scripture, then that particular congregation has no part with Jesus Christ, his original church body, or his future heaven. Recap Gospels Matthew, Mark, Luke and John We learn about Jesus' birth, life, ministry, the calling of his disciples, his miracles, his death, burial and resurrection. We also learn of John the Baptist ministry. What do we not find? No Christian church founded in the first four books of the New Testament or commonly known as the Gospels. Not one person received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. John chapter 7 verse 39. Only Jews could repent and have their sins forgiven in the four Gospels. Examples, the thief on the cross. A Jew, Luke chapter 13 verse 43. The man with palsy. Again Jewish, Mark chapter 2 verse 5. New Testament salvation for the Gentiles was not possible until after Jesus was crucified and ascended. Luke chapter 22 verse 32. Luke chapter 24 verse 27. Redemption was not offered to the Gentiles until Acts chapter 10. The book of Acts. We discover where and how the first church and every other church were founded and established. New Testament salvation was first experienced on the day of Pentecost Acts chapter 2, with a gathering of Jews from all surrounding nations. Gentiles were not partakers of this event. Establishing the God-ordained pattern of repentance, Jesus' name water baptism and receiving the Holy Spirit, with the initial evidence of speaking in tongues. Every disciple including Mary Jesus' mother, repented was baptized in Jesus' name, and received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with confirming evidence, the Spirit of God indwelt within them, they spoke with tongues. All churches founded by God obeyed His commanded pattern, blood, repentance, water, immersed in Jesus' name, fire, Holy Spirit entering your body temple. The first Gentile church was inaugurated in Acts chapter 10. Salvation is obeying Acts chapter 10 verses 44 through 48. Acts chapter 2 verse 38 and Acts chapter 19 verses 1 through 7. Epistles. Romans through Revelation. How to live after the new birth. The books were written to the churches, after they were baptized in Jesus' name and after they received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the initial evidence of speaking in tongues. Not the gift of tongues. Why were the epistles written? Answer, to instruct born-again Christians, not sinners, how to live, worship, church discipline and develop the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22. What is not found in the epistles? 
Not one person was baptized in all the epistles nor one person received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in all the epistles. The reason? They had already been baptized and received the baptism of the Holy Ghost otherwise these churches could not have been founded. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 30. I John chapter 3 verse 14. Warning. These epistles are never written as a substitute for the plan of salvation. Please become judgment ready. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 through 17. Three divisions of the Bible outlined authored by Pentecostal Herald July 1955. Apostolic Bible Institute Street Paul MN Minnesota author unknown. I want to thank you sincerely for following along with me, perhaps you have gained needed insights that have blessed you. It is my greatest hope that you will continue with the next installment, which being, creation versus evolution, the one question evolutionists cannot answer. Remember, God desires to love you forever. Truly yours. J.D. Leitner <laughs>